Yeah, absolutely. Do that. Okay. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Good afternoon. Let's get started. Our speaker today is Andrew McAllister. Andrew has over 20 years of experience in the energy uh, industry, especially focusing on energy efficiency and renewable energy. And currently, he serves as the managing director at the California Center for Sustainable Energy (CCSC). Um, Andrew has vast international experience. He has worked in Central and Southern America, Southeast Asia, and also uh, Africa. He has worked with the World Bank and Royal USAID in you know, almost name any uh, international organization. He seems to have uh, work, worked with them. He, he has also worked at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he has published widely in uh, trade, popular as well as academic uh, journals. His uh, undergrad degrees were in engineering sciences as well as art history from Dartmouth College and he holds a master's degree from Energy Resources Group at UC Berkeley. And I don't know how he does that. I mean, you, you really have to uh, know Andrew a little bit to understand how busy he, he is. So yesterday he met with a uh, governor of California, but he's, what my point is, he's also a doctoral student uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, so uh, it gi gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome Andrew, and he's going to talk on lessons from the California's energy system. All right. Andrew. Thanks, Ron. So thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. I, uh, you know, my advisors probably have wondered whether I'm actually a doctoral student. <laughs> so, you know, that's uh, not that I juggle all this stuff very well, I would say. Um, so it, uh, just as by way of preamble, um, it's really I've never actually uh, sort of interacted much in the ERCOT Texas environment. And, and, and uh, it's a big gap, I think, because, you know, we tend to assume in California that that you know it's all happening there and you know we got all there's environmentalists hanging from every tree and you know so we must be doing things you know right well you know the drawback of having so much involvement in a very sort of robust democracy on this, these issues is you have so many stakeholders often you can't really get anything done or when you have you have all these little initiatives that are done in silos and you don't really have the overall you know picture you, you've got a legislator who just thinks they know a lot so they pass a law and, uh, you know, they don't necessarily make sure that it fits in with the other legislative, you know, mandates and in, in the context that is, is uh, you know, more broadly in the energy sector or the electricity sector or what have you. So, um, you know, a more deliberative process uh, wouldn't be a bad thing. And I think we could learn um, quite a bit from what's happening in Texas, um, particularly on sort of transmission and wholesale issues, um, which is kind of a mess in California. So I, this is my obligatory slide about what CCSE is. Um, we do a lot of different things. We have about 85 people. We're based in San Diego. I won't go through all of this stuff, but we're sort of an alternative. We're sort of um, uh, um, a third party resource for regulators, local governments, smallish, well, any, any utility. We work with both some of the large IOUs, investor owned utilities, as well as uh, some of the municipals and smaller investment owned utilities really on program and policy issues. So we do a lot of program implementation on the ground, designing programs, whether they're rebate programs or technical assistance or whatever, trying to get markets up to speed and help contractors really make businesses of, of clean energy technologies. And then we take what works and we roll that up into the policy environment and try to get that in front of the legislature, in front of the regulators, so that they kind of get the broader implications of what they're doing, the broader context in which they're making decisions. So there aren't very many organizations that have the sort of positioning to be able to do that. And it's very exciting because, you know, we get the calls from all over the place about, okay, well, you know, the utilities are telling me this, you know, what's, just, what's the scoop really, right? Um, because, you know, investor in utilities particularly, but also at the local level, um, municipal utilities, their, their politics, their broader business goals, there's a lot of competing uh, priorities that they have going on. And clean energy, is, it's one of them possibly, but it's not the only one and it's, you never quite know which one is running the show. So, so we sort of serve as a resource to ground truth um, what's going on. So um, I'm going to go through sort of the overall California policy context and I'm, I'm most of this presentation is going to be about um, retail, net metered type of uh, installation, uh, relatively small rooftop, sub one megawatt uh, installations for renewable energy. Um, but I'll bleed over a little bit into wholesale markets because they're obviously related. So the California just went to a 33% um, 
our renewable portfolio standard by 2020. Um, and it's pretty sure that there's going to be a law at some point here pretty soon to go to 40% or even more. That brings up all sorts of issues for the longer term about how you deal with those kinds of penetrations, uh, just technically and what that means for rates and things like that. Um, but this is policy and it's going gonna, it's gonna to move forward and the utilities look like they're going to meet it. There's the, the prices of particularly large scale PV photovoltaics are, are coming down precipitously and um, you know, there's some big procurement, at least some contracts being signed for these big resources. Um, whether those projects actually get built and what they look like once they get built is an open question. But, um, you know, 40% RPS is a pretty, pretty big deal. And in California, we, we have virtually zero coal. The only coal energy we have uh, is what's left over from some long-term contracts. But utilities cannot sign long-term contracts going forward for coal power. So the, the carbon footprint of the mix in California is already pretty low. A lot of hydro from the Northwest, a lot of gas, uh, natural gas, and increasingly a lot of solar and wind. Uh, so a feed-in tariff is under development. It's being real. It's really slow. Uh, it's problematic in some ways that we'll talk about. Um, there's a renewables auction mechanism, um, which is another procurement um, strategy that the a procurement program that the utilities can use to procure uh, green energy um, under the RPS. That is, uh, it's a reverse auction mechanism. So it's it's uh, for medium-sized systems. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Governor Brown is all about clean energy. After the budget, the budget in California is his number one issue. Number two is energy. <laughs> he hasn't solved number one yet, but he's still working on number two. Um, and he has a goal uh, to get 12 gigawatts of what we're calling localized renewables um, in California um, by, I believe it's by 2020, um, which is totally doable. We've got, I think, five or so gigawatts uh, under in the pipeline right now, five or six, and there's some programs in place that we'll talk about here that, that should help us get there. Uh, there's sort of some tension between um, the, the, the solar marketplace is very diverse. It's kind of hard to refer to it as one thing, um, but there are folks who make their living, you know, businesses that make their living installing small scale rooftop on homes and businesses all the way up to, you know, mega, mega projects out in the California desert, you know, inland. Um, and even within the distributed generation marketplace, the larger projects, say one to five megawatts, are fundamentally different from the rooftop stuff. So there's some tension between those two stakeholders, those two kind of groups of, of uh, installers, uh, um, um, integrators, developers. Uh, and that'll, come, that'll become clear, I think, when I talk about some of, these, some of these policy instruments that are in place in California. So those 12 gigawatts, where are they going to come from? Open question. Is it small systems or large systems? So we have a, a very, I was referring to at the beginning, we have a very robust um, regulatory um, ecosystem, let's say. Uh, anybody can have a voice if all you have to do, uh, particularly at the Public Utilities Commission, you have to have a little bit of money to pay a lawyer to submit comments. You have to kind of pay attention. You can be on the service list and you'll get all the stuff and you can submit comments. And the PUC is obligated to read those comments and at least try to take them into account. Not that they have to, they, have, they don't have to do, if you're not informed and your comments are, are horrible, obviously not. But there's a broad participation platform that gets used. Um, so uh, uh, it can be, you know, there's a big discussion. So often it takes a while to get through that. So that's a democratic process. It's a good thing generally, but it does slow things down. Um, so there's also a, um, you know, there's inherent tension between investing more, uh, going green, to the extent that those options are, are more expensive in the near term. And we can talk about individual technologies as to whether they actually are. But if they are, you have ratepayer impacts, you have longer term, uh, you know, you, you potentially have, um, depending on the instrument, you have one class of customers subsidizing another, so you have the cross subsidies going on. So those issues really get hashed out. And that's very important to policymakers. You know, their constituencies are the ones yelling about these issues and they have to take them into account. So the least cost approach, that's sort of another way of stating this. Um, least cost, best fit is sort of, okay, we, we as the utility want to get the right kind of resource at the lowest cost so we can not have to pass additional costs that aren't necessary uh, along to ratepayers. Um, so, however, if you want to 
say, take fuel cells and get them into the marketplace, and you think that's a policy, you know, it's a policy decision that that's a good thing for the diversity of supply or whatever, take advantage of cheap natural gas, you know, whatever it is, um, that's going to be more expensive in the near term. And in order to support that marketplace, you're going to have to have some subsidies, you're going to have to pay more for that power in the near term. So this cost base, you know, the fuel cell lobby would say, hey, we need a you know, higher price for our energy because it's this policy goal. And ratepayer advocates would say, no way, I don't want to pay for that. So there's this tension that's kind of always there. Um, and AB1X, I'm sorry for the acronym, but Assembly Bill 1X, X means extraordinary session. That was in 2002, I believe, 2001 or 2002. And that's the piece of legislation in California that got us out of the crisis, the energy crisis that we had in 2001 and 2002. So ABX, AB1X um, did a lot of things, but one of the things that it did was uh, the deal that it brokered to save the investor and utilities from bankruptcy um, essentially fixed lower tier uh, energy prices, like the baseline for you know, the, the, the first energy you use, the essential energy, if you're a residential customer, the, the baseline energy, it fixed the price of that at roughly 12 cents um, and said it can only go up a tiny amount each year. Okay, so it's still basically like 13 cents today, 10 years later. Um, and the result of that is that um, any rate increases since 2001 have had to go into the higher tiers. So we're going to see the impact of that here pretty soon. It's created kind of a bubble for small scale solar, which is great for the, you know, for the immediate term if you're out there selling solar, but it makes it, it, makes it uh, sort of unsustainable for the long term. Um, also, California, uh, final point here, this is all just context. Um, energy efficiency is top of the loading order. It's the number one resource. It's, it's, uh, if a utility can get energy efficiency, uh, energy savings ch more cheaply than they can go out and get new renewables, they have, they, they're supposed to do that. So again, what that looks like in practice is maybe a little more complex, but energy efficiency is, a, is the top um, clean energy focus in California. So that's a map of San Diego. Each one of those yellow dots is a, is a small residential PV solar system. Uh, there's some solar water heating systems that hasn't caught on quite as much, but it's, it's increasing. You know, each one of these purple dots is a water heating system. Oh, I'm sorry, each one of the red dots. Um, maybe orange, probably look orange right here, yeah, sorry. Um, and, uh, but the vast majority are residential, but about two thirds of the capacity are actually the larger commercial systems. Uh, the, the green dots, uh, yeah, the green and the uh, teal dots, uh, the, the teal being uh, government systems. So those tend to be larger, more capacity. But uh, there are over 10,000 rooftop solar systems in um, San Diego. It's the most solar city in the whole country. Um, well, definitely in California and by extension the whole country. Um, and um, it's about, uh, we passed, I believe, 100 megawatts not too long ago. So, so there's a good amount of, um, of solar in San Diego. It's a robust, professionalized marketplace for rooftop and small commercial systems. All these are net metered systems, so they're, they're interconnected on the customer side of the meter, not on the utility side of the meter. And you can see just the take, the solar is just taken off. The, the bands there are the different programs. The first program was the Emerging Renewables program that's covered solar. And then the self-generation incentive program and the California Solar Initiative is the program that's um, currently in place and has been since January 2007. Um, and there's a, there are a few other, there's some legacy systems and there's some other, other systems there that are not net metered that put us over, over 100 megawatts. Um, so the, San Diego is the top county here, but you can see Los Angeles, Santa Clara County, where San Jose is, uh, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino. All of these counties have a lot of solar in them, and that's megawatts down at the bottom, so you can sum it all up, and the state you know, has um, going on a gigawatt of PV. And this is all net metered rooftop. And we can see you know, one goal of the California Solar Initiative explicitly was to try to get prices down. And I think there was some discussion about whether one market, even if it was a big one, could actually do that. And, and whether this program is driving it or not, I think is an open question. I think it's, it, it may not, you know, all of these reductions aren't due to one program in California, because uh, right in here for the last few years, you've seen PV prices go down globally. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see substantial prices. So we're still talking about, 
you know, even for large, large-ish non-residential net metered systems, you're still talking six dollars a watt. Which, if you compare to wholesale, it's still pretty expensive. Wholesale is going to be in the two to three dollar range at this point. So, you know, is that premium worth it for having it be small scale in basin? A lot of people, a lot of people think it is. Um, one point, one point to make too is that, you know, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later. But the um, non-residential, depending on the rate structures, one problem of, of net energy metering is that depending on what rate structure you're under as a customer. Uh, it may be difficult to figure out what the benefit of PV actually is. So if you're a residential and your energy is super expensive and you're reducing that energy, clearly you're going to have a good value proposition. But commercial rates have multiple components. They're hard to decipher, you know, and, and um, you know, we can talk about um, specifics. But the, the, also the commercial property owner and the solar developers have sharper pencils. They're basically operating with a kind of bottom line attitude. And it's a tougher value proposition in the commercial sector than in the residential sector. And so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of folks who sort of started down this path of doing a, a solar project in the commercial sphere, um, and even in the, non, the, the, the governmental sphere, who are now kind of sitting on their hands wondering if they really want to do the project because they're not sure that they have confidence that, that the conditions are going to persist for over the 20 year lifetime of this project because you are dependent on having the rates in place. You're depending on the utility, the next rate case, all of these things that you can't predict. So there are a lot of, particularly in LA, where you have other issues going on as well, you, know, you have a lot of projects, a lot of megawatts sitting there that haven't been installed yet. So we're, we're, um, we're, kinda, we're trying to solve those problems as well. So um, let's see, who here is familiar with electricity rates? All right, check it out. Unbelievable. Okay, good. We'll talk to your neighbor if they're not. But um, uh, so net energy metering, I'm going to go through uh, several, five sort of procurement ways that utilities procure <coughs> renewable energy. And net metering is kind of a backdoor way to procure renewable energy because you're, you, if you're the utility, you're not actually procuring it through net metering. What you're doing is, is, uh, is no longer supplying some portion of a customer's energy because they're generating, generating it themselves. If you're the customer, you're offsetting your utility com consumption. So, and then what you pay for is the net, hence the name. So it's, it, on the surface, it's very simple, right? Oh, I'm offsetting my utility energy and at the end of the month they net it out and that's what I owe, basically. Um, in practice, it's a little more difficult because um, you have to actually know what your rates are. You have to know how much energy you're going to produce. If you really want to know that number, you have some, some work to do. And um, so, you know, particularly in the non-res sphere, these, uh, a lot of the folks who are out there selling solar are doing it with a bundled rate, which means sort of an average per kilowatt hour charge. So, hey, you, you know, customer X, commercial entity X, you're... Your, uh, your average cost of energy, if you take, uh, take your total bill and, you know, or take your total kilowatt hours and divide it by your total bill, you've got a cost per kilowatt hour average, okay? And say it's 17 cents. Well, I can give you solar and I'll only charge you 15 cents for that energy. You're good to go. Well, it doesn't work that way because you have an energy component and a demand component and solar isn't going to really lower that demand component much. So what you're really saying being is the energy commodity charge, which is going to be like, you know, six, seven cents in Texas, it's probably lower than that. So, uh, so I think there's, a, there's a, a, some informational barriers and asymmetries and stuff like that in the marketplace, particularly in the non-residential sector, that, um, that sort of make, it, make net metering a little bit complicated. Um, also, don't want to leave solar thermal out. Solar thermal is, even though natural gas prices are incredibly cheap right now, solar thermal, that's solar water heating, and there's some industrial applications too, that reduces carbon emissions very effectively if you have coal or natural gas-based power. So this was the point I was making before, is that net energy metering, everything is mediated by the rates. So rate making is absolutely critical. And we happen to be in a time in California where our rates are very distorted. So it makes net metering kind of a, kind of a strange, an unpredictable phenomenon going forward. There's a rate case. Each investor in utility in California has a new rate case every three years. So presumably, if you make a decision and your payback is eight years for your solar system, you're going to see at least you know, two or three sets of rates through that time, and who knows what, how that's going to affect your, um, you know, your payback. And this is, uh, this is actually, I've been doing quite a bit of research about this, and there's a lot in this graph, so I'm going to spend a few minutes on it. 
um, so I mentioned the, the tiers. This is a residential customer, or it's uh, sort of a residential, uh, this is the residential sector. So there, there used to be five tiers. This is for SDG&E territory, so the San Diego Gas and Electric Service territory. There used to be five tiers. Tier five went away and got, got combined with tier four in 08. Um, right here, up to this point, going backwards from uh, on January 1 of 09, uh, the investment, the federal investment tax credit for solar went from a cap of $2,000 to an uncapped 30%. So you can see that there's kind of a little bit of a lull there and then boom, it takes off as the market gets its, gets its mind around, around wow, the, this just improved my economics tremendously. So the top, the, the, so you can see the tiers, you know, the baseline is in the 14 cents, the, the tier two, which is 100 to 130% of baseline, is a little bit more expensive. And then tiers three and four, particularly after um, 08, really go up. And that's because all the rate increases and all, the, uh, all, all of the uncertainty, all the rate increases can't go into the baseline. They have to go into the top tiers. So you have this huge gap of about almost, well, really like 16, 18 cents between tier two and tier three. And so if you're a solar vendor, what are you going to propose to the customer? You're going to say, I, I can put in a solar system that offsets your top tiers and then leaves you with the baseline, right? That's the, by far the most cost-effective approach. The person will be way better off. Um, their utility bill will go down tremendously, and, and their, their, the cost of solar generation isn't, isn't as high as what they're offsetting. So the top purple line is the full cost of, it's a 100-year, 100 100-system 100, uh, moving average, full cost of solar system on a, um, per kilowatt hour life cycle of energy basis. So the next one down includes the rebate. So in California, we have declining rebates. So it starts out at $2.50 a watt, and it ends at the end of uh, 2010 at about 30 cents a watt. So that's the program design. It's meant to have declining incentives, performance basis. You get in early, you get a bigger incentive. So you can see the moving average goes down precipitously when the ITC uh, the, the higher ITC kicks in, and you end up with uh, a cost, uh, life cycle cost of energy, the out of pocket of the customer at you know, roughly 15, 16 cents. So you're generating solar at 16 cents and you're offsetting 35 to 40 cents. So that is a value proposition you know, extraordinaire and has really been driving the expansion of the residential solar market in California. So what's going to happen is that when, so it's an artifact of this legislation that I talked about. And so what's going to happen when we, when we outgrow that legislation, when the bonds that it generated sunset or when another legislative initiative comes in to kind of get us past AB1X, we're going to have um, potentially a pretty traumatic event in the residential solar marketplace. So uh, that's kind of the, what everybody's jockeying around in California right now. There are all sorts of bills about how we're, you know, how are we going to both deal with AB1X but not kill the small-scale solar market. And it's a real concern. It's a topic of big discussion in California right now. And it, in fact, when I met with the governor yesterday, that's all he wanted to talk about. <laughs> so, I mean, you'd think you'd have other things to talk about. <laughs> so, so that's sort of net metering, which is where I spend a lot of my life. The feed-in tariff is the next one, sort of, and I'm going by, by scale. So the net metering is the smallest, sort of from one kilowatt up to a megawatt. The feed-in tariff starts technically at one kilowatt and goes up to, I believe it's three megawatts, uh, or up to five megawatts, actually. It's a kind of a pilot program. There's a statewide cap of 750 megawatts, but the PUC hasn't even sort of finished the proceeding yet. This, this uh, legislation went into place. It was, it was uh, uh, signed into law in, in um, 2009, and we've been trying to get the PUC to implement it, uh, and they're, you know, plodding along, and they haven't gotten there yet. So the investor-owned utilities, the IOUs, they have the, they filed applications to essentially build, own, and operate their own PV. So that way they can rate base it and they can earn a rate of return on it. And that's sort of a more traditional utility model. In SDG&E territory, in San Diego Gas and Electric territory, for example, which is about 10% of California, uh, just to use an example, they proposed uh, 100, I think it's 24 and 76, uh, 100 megawatts of of this essentially build, own, operate. 
Um, and the, the, the PUC came back and said, well, you can build and operate some of it, but we want you to procure a big chunk of it too. So 76 just by the utility, just by the utility, just by the utility, just by the utility. And those are also up to five megawatts. So the renewables auction mechanism is a relatively new instrument that's a reverse auction. I think I talked about this a little bit before. Those are up to starting at, I believe, one megawatt, but going up to 20. And what we're seeing is the first round of bids for the RAM, this uh, renew renewables auction mechanism, have just come in. The prices are very low, and all the systems that they've accepted are essentially 20 megawatts. So you're getting largish, almost basically utility-scale systems. And they're coming in apparently at, you know, seven, eight, nine cents a kilowatt hour. So that's cheap. And it's going to be difficult for a net metered, you know, without the net metering support, it's going to be difficult for rooftop solar to compete with that price. It's going to be very difficult for the fit. Uh, if, 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 if the RAM price is used as the reference for the, for the fit, then the fit is not going to have any traction at all. That's the worry as well, is that if, if we've put all this blood, sweat, and tears into designing a feed-in tariff, which a lot of people think is really the next best thing, you know, the next, the next thing after net metering that's going to drive the small-scale solar market, but we're limited to a, a price that doesn't make it work, then it will have all been in vain. And then the largest systems, utility scale, out in the desert, uh, you know, far inland in California, they require transmission to get into the, into the um, population centers. Those are the sort of RPS standard utility scale request for offers where those are 20 megs and up and you know, big area. When you're driving on the freeway past them, you're gonna spend a while to go through one of them. So I've been sort of beating this drum for the last couple of years really. Um, so each one, of these, each one of these instruments has kind of been developed in a silo. So there's somebody's, somebody's idea at the PUC or a legislative initiative or, you know, a group of advocates get together and push a, a piece of legislation. Um, but they haven't really been seen in this, as one ecosystem, as one continuous marketplace, right? And there are differences in scale, you know, no, no question. But there's been really, I think, a dearth of coordination between these instruments so that they can work together and so the marketplace knows what the heck to do. So you, if, you're a, if you're a developer, like, okay, what am I going to do in this place versus that place? You have no idea. Or what you're going to get paid for a given size system if it's eligible for three or four different programs, right? So, so that's the kind of, you know, program soup we get in California that I think we could do better <laughs> at, at, at uh, putting in place. We could study things a little bit more, but, you know, and then, and then sort of make the, the strategic decisions a little more effectively. So this is my uh, sort of, you know, grade school attempt to, to graph these different mechanisms, okay? So uh, uh, try to give you a visceral sense of how they might fit together or what some of the issues are. So we have a lot of uncertainty um, about price, and we, we have some lack of transparency. So the, the green box, well, so the blue box is net energy metering, and this is one kilowatt, one kilowatt capacity, right? So 0 0.001 megawatts. This is 100 kilowatts, this is a megawatt, so on up to 20 and, and, and plus. You know, the, the, the price, the implicit price for all of these mechanisms varies. So if you're offsetting top tier energy with net metering, you're gonna be way up in the top left of that blue box. If you're a baseline customer and you're still choosing to go solar, you might be a little bit down here in, in, in a lower cost of energy. The, all of these instruments I'm talking about sort of fit together like, like in, in a continuum, but I'll talk a little bit about where this is really idealized. It's actually not like this at all. <laughs> the, the transparency of a box reflects the program transparency. So you can see the, I've lumped the utility applications and the renewables auction mechanism together. They probably are going to be together actually in practice. Um, to eliminate one of those programs and just put them all in the RAM. But uh, the public, the, the, the prices that are determined by these contracts are not public. Nobody will know them, right? So if you bid into the RAM and a utility, you get a contract, um, there's no obligation that the utility or the PUC or anybody make the, con the terms of that contract public. So from my perspective, that's a problem because it doesn't give a reference point to the rest of the market about what is actually out there working. Um, you can see from the IP perspective that you might, you know, the, the, the company might not want to tell the world, you know, what, it, what its price is or what it was able to negotiate or whatever. But uh, if, you know, if you're an advocate and you kind of want to sort of push this discussion forward, it makes it harder to do that if you don't know the details. So the floors here are uncertain. And if you're a technology vendor or, a, you know, let's, we could talk about any technology, you know, any, any eligible RPS technology, <clears throat> you know, you can... 
uh, you can imagine, okay, well, if I don't even know what the minimum price I'm going to get is, then it makes it hard for me to, to develop my business, right? Because it makes it hard for me to write a business model. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about both the FIT, the RAM, and the RFOs as well, because that information isn't public. Um, so I'm going to do a, a revamp, sort of a modernized version of that idealized graph here in a second. Um, but there's a lot going on. So there, uh, there was a treasury grant program that floated a lot of the upfront cost for, non for larger net metered systems that went away, the 1603 grant program. That was stimulus funded and now it's gone. Um, state incentives are going down in California. They're, they're very low now. Uh, it sounds like Austin Energy still has uh, quite some strong incentives for PV, which is great. Um, the net metering has a cap. So the net metering cap is 5% of peak demand of each utility service territory. So, you know, say for example, SDG&E's peak demand is 5,000. So that means, you know, 5,000 megawatts. So 5% of that is, what, 25 megawatts? No, 250 megawatts. Um, so once we get, we're at over 100 megawatts. So once we get to 250 megawatts, we have installed PV. We can't put any more. sdg is not obliged to interconnect those systems. So we'll be done. So there's a big movement now to try to get the net metering cap lifted. And that is generating huge controversy. That's probably going to be the biggest battle in the clean energy marketplace this year in California. And there are a lot of, a lot of, different, um, a lot of different opinions about that one. So the federal investment tax credit, I mean, uh, you know, luckily the super committee in, in Congress never got its act together. But if it had, that would have been a target. And, and you can imagine, um, you can imagine a, a different political environment where the federal ITC was a target because, you know, we're not about uh, tax breaks for specific technologies. And um, so that could be a threat. And as you saw in that previous graph, that tax credit enables solar. You know, that gap between the full cost and the t cost with the tax credit. So the, f the feed-in tariff, so these, the, to your point, the, the feed-in tariff here, there was a recent ruling just a couple weeks ago um, from the PUC that sets the fit price at the highest um, average RAM price uh, for an accepted contract in each utility service, tor service territory. So what does that mean? The reverse auction mechanism um, you bid in, you bid in, you bid in, they get a queue of projects and they accept the projects up to the capacity that they're trying to procure. And the price at that, that last contract that gets accepted is the highest proposed price. And that price is going to be the reference now for the feed-in tariff. So we think, we don't know because none of this is public, but we think that that, that price has been, it came in um, for, I believe it was for Edison, for the Los Angeles area utility um, at about eight to nine cents a kilowatt hour. So if you're looking to make a business, business of installing, uh, you know, after net metering goes away and you want to install PV on commercial rooftops um, and you know that all you're going to get is eight cents, then you got to have a pretty sharp pencil to make that work right now. So, so if net metering were to go away and it were to be replaced with the fit, because that would be the only other, pro the only other procurement mechanism for the, the, those small rooftop systems, then you know, we have to worry about the price. And the technology, you know, the solar industry and all the other clean energy industries are really worried about this issue. And um, uh, it seems like really the, the screws are starting to get tightened to get costs down. So we're going to see a winnowing out of the clean energy marketplace in California. The folks who can compete on price and have the business models that can get that price down, bring in lots of uh, tax equity, can really be efficient, are the ones who are going to win. So exactly what that looks like, I think uh, we don't know yet. So that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But we don't know what the low end was, right? I mean, they might have all come in at that, or they might be at a four cent guy down there. I don't, we don't know. We, and, and, you know, we may never know. <laughs> so, uh, and we don't even know that number, actually. That's just scuttlebutt, you know, like the lobbyists in Sacramento. I, I, I don't know, right? Um, you know, there's a, I think the medium scale marketplace is definitely evolving uh, quickly as there's, uh, as, as those mechanisms, the RAM, you know, up to 20 megawatts um, gets, as that, as, that, as that marketplace gets going, um, you are seeing a lot of investment into those, those medium distributed scale systems. You know, in a utility parlance, you know, 20 megawatts is small. 
right? You have to have hundreds of megawatts really to be like a, an actual, you know, real power plant, right? That's the, the electrical engineer sort of view of the world. Um, and, and you can do up to 20 megawatts or so like in basin, you know, in open areas within populated areas. You know, you can definitely do five, you know, three, four, five megawatts in those areas. So those have the advantage where you can put them, some, you can embed them within the distribution system without building big transmission lines, which is, uh, you know, obviously a value. So, but all of these issues um, have been problematic in getting uh, RPS or renewable portfolio standard projects developed. Uh, you know, clearly finance. I mean, luckily we're coming out of the back end of the financing uh, bottleneck, but that's been huge. There hasn't been capital available. Site control is always an issue. All the levels of permitting have been a huge problem, and we're starting to work through the the larger scale jurisdictional stuff, like the federal. And uh, I mean, Charlie, you probably <laughs> you probably worked on that in your day. But uh, but the the state is better than it was. Uh, but you know, we have not only uh, NEPA, but we have CEQ we have uh, CEQA. Um, that uh, you know the environmental issues that you have to work through then you have county and you have county and then you have even local jurisdictions that have a say in whether a project gets permitted and so you have all these stakeholders weighing into that process that is definitely uh, acrimonious so um, interconnection requirements are variable some utilities are really hard to get an interconnection study and get the get a system uh, interconnected and it takes literally years so if you're a developer and you've got all this capital sitting there, you've got a bunch of investors that are waiting to, to you know, get the system installed, they want to start seeing some revenue, it makes it very difficult if, if your utility won't interconnect or won't even do the study to interconnect and won't give you a yay or nay, right? It's, it makes it hard. Um, so yeah, equipment supply and, proc and procurement is definitely less of a problem now than it was. Um, yeah, and even some manufacturing is coming back to California, which is pretty cool. Uh, the, the, to, to, supply some of the equipment for a few um, RPS projects for SDG&E, for example. Soytec came and they're building a factory in, um, in San Diego County. So um, they chose to do that rather than do it in China or Mexico or wherever. So it's, that, that, that's a nice trend. So net energy metering still completely subject to what the rates are. Um, the fit, we think it's lower than we thought. And I'm actually, honestly, the reason this is a, is a dotted line is that I'm dubious that any, any small scale projects would get done under the fit. Like you really have to have an economies of scale of at least, you know, 50 or so kilowatts to even think about that. A, a residential rooftop probably isn't going to be able to do it at eight cents a kilowatt hour. So if that's really what, how this plays out, then you might, uh, you know, I don't think you'll have small, the smallest fit uh, systems. Yeah, so that's the, the from one to 20s in the RAM, from one to 20 megawatts, and then you have the RFOs uh, from there up. So what you're going to see is, is, I think, downward pressure across the board for, on price. And you're going to have some consolidation, uh, some shaking out of the solar industry um, as a result. Um, so what we were just talking about, the fit terms need to be set. Turns out they're going to be based on the RAM deals themselves. Uh, so those two programs just have to, uh, it's not clear at all. I think there's no policy direction about how anyone sees those two programs fitting together. So that's what I've been. That's what we've been trying to push on for a while now, um, with I'd say not the greatest success. Um, so yeah, so, so I think uh, you know I, I presented something like this at SPI uh, last year, and and you know it's not a happy story for some of the solar guys out there, but it is really actually they got the guys um, the the more innovative business models, folks that have their own capital or they have a really good line to inexpensive capital. And they have some, uh, some utility experience and understand the interconnection process. <coughs> um, they, uh, they, they actually think they can, they can do pretty well. But again, it's all about what the minimum, what the prices are. So, you know, what price is going to allow you know, small scale DG to continue to grow? And I think that's anybody's guess. So there's, there's really a paradigm difference. So when we're talking about net metering, there's this really, it's, it's shaping up to just be a battle royale. And, the reason is that you have two kind of different world views. Here's the solar industry, folks who want to see more small scale solar, and here are the utilities. And the utilities see massive cross subsidies through net metering right now. They see, um, uh, you know, they, they are wondering kind of what their next business model looks like. It's forcing them to think about what it's like to be a poles and wires company and where they're going to get their revenue. Um, you know, they want to send, they want to have transparent, accurate price signals, which net metering doesn't really allow them to do. 
um, they want to meet the RPS mandates, and actually net meter generation does not qualify for RPS. The, the, the RECs, the renewable energy credits, actually uh, are owned by the system owner, not the utility. So that's the case. The PUC ruled on that several years ago. It's not uniform. If you're a municipal utility, you can choose to take the, take the RECs. Um, but if you're an investor in utility regulated by the CPUC, the RECs are not yours. They belong to the system owner. So if you're a utility and you're supposed to be procuring renewable energy and you don't even get the RPS from, from net metering, you don't even get that credit, then why would you even want to promote this at all, right? So, so there's just different worldviews, and I think um, the gap is pretty large. And so something's got to give on both sides, and we're going to end up somewhere in the middle. Yeah, interesting stuff happening on finance. Um, these third-party ownership and hybrid financing models are taken off. Uh, last month, about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of our um, residential uh, solar systems in, in the San Diego region went in under a lease or a PPA model. So that's a third-party owner where you sign a contract and you just pay monthly to them instead of the utility. Uh, but given, you know, there's a clear value proposition for that to happen because given how expensive that top-tier energy is. Um, there's some, some property assessed finance developments that are, that are positive. So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about transportation. I'm going to whip through this um, because we, it came up a lot today. So I thought I'd actually put some uh, at the electricity conference we, we, we were at today. And yesterday, um, there was a lot of talk about um, electric vehicles and even their use for ancillary services as a grid benefit and this sort of thing. And San Diego is the number one, uh, the place the, the most, with the most deployment in the whole country of, um, of plug-in electric vehicles. Um, California's got a, actually over 10, I think over right around 10,000 now. A whole new flock of them came in. And about 1,500 of those are in San Diego County. Yeah, so if you'll look at the, these are the concentrations of plug-in electrics. So it's LA, San Diego, and, and the Bay Area. And there are the three, um, you know, by zip code and with some more detail there. So you can see it's fairly locational. You have, you have people, we've done some survey information already on these folks. We run the rebate program that gives adopters of, um, of uh, plug-in electrics their state incentive. There's a $1,500 to $3,000 incentive for these cars. And that's the Chevy Volt and it's on Leaf, you know, a few others. Um, and so we know where these guys are. And we have done some surveys of these folks. And, you know, a very high percentage of them either have PV. It's like 35% already have PV. And another 25 or so percent think they're going to get PV. So, you know, you're seeing a, s a lot of overlap with early adopters of, of plug-in electrics and, and PV. Uh, which is, you know, which is interesting. It means that you can go to some of these places and do... do, do um, some fairly specific research about you know, why and what the impacts are and the distribution level impacts and that kind of thing. So the, the program is called the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project um, and it's uh, mostly run by the California Air Resources Board, which is the agency that is uh, overseeing climate policy in, in California and also the California Energy Commission. Yeah, so there's a whole, there are a whole bunch of um, rebate or there's a whole bunch of um, EV infrastructure projects and incentives available, and California has really made uh, a priority of this, um, particularly in northern the Bay Area and in LA and San Diego. So uh, another thing that happened actually, so again, the, the electricity, we live with the electricity crisis of 10 years ago every day in California. It really, it's kind of getting old. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that happened there was that Dynagy was one of the, the you know, Enron-like companies that really manipulated the marketplace and ended up costing a lot of people money. And they've been in litigation ever since and finally came to a settlement with the Public Utilities Commission about how much they were going to pay for all of their shenanigans in 2001 and 2. So uh, since then, NRG Energy um, procured Dynagy and now took on those liabilities. And all, everybody wanted it off their books. So just a couple weeks ago, they announced um, a deal that was brokered by the governor's office to have NRG give $120 million back. And $100 million of that is going to go to EV charging infrastructure across the state. Um, so, so that's about five times the existing level of, in, of, of incentive investment and, and is going to plug right into the policy process and really jumpstart uh, deployment of EV charging infrastructure. Um, so lots of programs in California for clean air and, and low emissions vehicles. Um, the Department of Energy also and the Energy Commission have um, EV readiness uh, projects going that are really helping local and regional governments plan for EV deployment. So where do you put the chargers? 
Um, you know, are they level one, level two, level three chargers? A lot of infrastructure questions, a lot of jurisdictional and agency questions. Um, so at, at the local regional level, these discussions just have to happen or it's just going to be a huge problem. So these readiness projects cover, you know, the major population centers in the state. Um, yeah, so roughly the same. Um, so, and then last, uh, well, this is the last slide. I mean, we're probably a little over time here, but, you know, again, exists. So it's not just about DG. I've talked mostly about procurement of clean energy and generation and, uh, at the various scales. But uh, California's top priority is energy efficiency. And we have actually a goal to retrofit every existing building older than a certain age by 2020. I mean, you know, think how hard it is just to get people to, I mean, you know, insulate their homes or work on their HVAC system or whatever. Like really, you know, having policy push that hard is a, is a, is a huge lift. And people have to want to do it. You know, we had a lot of discussions this morning about behavior and why people make decisions. And they have, it has to bring a, a whole bunch of benefits to somebody in order for them to let a contractor come in their home and get their carpets dirty and, you know, cost them a bunch of money and then apply for a rebate and, you know, all of that stuff. It's not, a, it's not a simple thing. And most people have lives and they don't have time to be home. They have to take off work. You know, so it's a, it's a difficult commodity to sell this retrofit, this home upgrade business. Um, but yet there's a lot of benefit to it. And it's not just energy. It's all sorts of benefits. So uh, that's where policy in California is going. And what, you know, what I'm trying to push for and a lot of similarly minded people are is trying to get the small scale distributed generation and the, the energy efficiency sides of the house to talk together so that you can have coherent policy that's easy and streamlined and sort of doesn't put up unnecessary barriers. Um, financing is a big part of that as well. There's got to be accessible financing that you can ag agree to across the kitchen table. You know, so maybe you can do that with solar, but maybe you can also do that with replacing some of your windows and your HVAC system and, uh, you know, uh, windows or whatever, you know, insulation, whatever else. So. So there, there, there are a lot of ways you can improve your energy uh, profile, and generation is one, but there's a lot of other ones. So that's it. I hope uh, we have some time for questions. Hi, uh, great talk. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, so um, last summer I spent, I worked for a company called Terra Verde Renewable Partners. I don't know what if was it called? Terra Verde Renewable Partners. Okay. Um, and what they do is they run an RFP process for commercial scale solar, largely with schools, mm -hmm. allows for public financing and the way the net metering works. Yeah. Um, we take advantage of their load profiles mm -hmm. and switch them to the A6 rates. Yeah. And, you Where, know, this is here in Texas? This is in or, Marin County. Oh, Marin County. Okay. The A6. Yeah. So PG&E. Okay. Um, yeah. So or you're part of the authority. Huh? Are they customers of the authority or are they customer like the, the Marin Clean Energy Authority? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Marin County has this great community choice aggregation program going. So, I'm sure they're, anyway. they're, yeah, they're... Sorry, go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> so my question is, um, the way that those deals would work is they would take advantage of the difference between the on-peak and the off-peak pricing. Yeah. Um, but you're saying that that might go away. But there's also the RPS, you know, to contend with. So I guess my question for yeah. you is, do you see that market going away of being able to play off that differential and... Um, and build these commercial scale plants? Um, so we do a lot of work with schools and the rate structures are, they're not the same exactly, but they're roughly equivalent in the three big investor owned utilities. So we, you know, we mostly work in schools in sdg &E territory, but uh, you know, this blended rate issue deal is really a big deal. And so, you know, one, you have to really get a handle on the rates going forward. And a lot, you know, so I, I'm not sure about the A6, uh, the terms of it, but the equivalent rate in sdg and &E is that you can't go on that new sort of solar friendly rate unless you have a system of a certain size. Otherwise, you're stuck with the old rate, right? Yeah, these would typically yeah. Be, be between about 50 kilowatts and 2 megawatts. Okay. And the A6 rate eliminates your demand charge. Yeah, you exactly. go down right. about okay. 200 bucks a month. And, yeah, uh, so... And so, you pay 40 cents on peak, but you're not paying it because the solar system's producing. So. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the issue here is that if, if, if you are all, if your whole cost is a variable cost, so you're paying energy charge only and you have no demand charge, then that's a sweet deal and you should go for it, right? Uh, PG&E hates that because they are leaving money there. It's really, uh, that's great revenue for them to have and they're losing it because it's all being offset. And not only is the, is the energy charge, what they go out and pot, buy energy for, not only are they losing that, but they're also losing the cost of the, of the hard, the fixed costs 
to have the grid come up to the door of that school. So from their perspective, they're, they're, all their other customers are having to subsidize the infrastructure that's, that's providing basic service to that school. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of mimicking them, like that's their argument. There are, there are arguments against that. But, but that is why all, all of the large uh, investor and utilities in California are trying to, to sort of modify net metering so that it's less impactful. So I can't tell you, you know, I don't have a crystal ball on like what that's going to come to, I can't say. But for sure, PG&E, they have a piece of legislation, they have a piece of legislation in front of uh, uh, the legislature now in California that would, that would, that would uh, basically require all, solar, well, all customers to pay at least part of their bill on, as a fixed charge. And, and so that they, they wouldn't be in this pickle of having it all be variable and therefore offsetable by solar. Because, you know, if, if, if nighttime comes, you still need the grid at your door, right? You, or you've got to put in storage. You've got to make big investments if you're really going to disown the grid. So the utility has still, even though you don't have any net consumption, the utility has still made investments on your behalf that, that are infrastructure that's there. And so that, those costs need to be covered somehow transparently and, you know, hopefully equitably. And that's really the discussion that's going on with net metering right now. So hopefully that answer your question. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the interplay between uh, sort of the energy payments, so the feed-in tariff and net metering, and the rebates uh, for distributed solar. Okay, yeah. And, and whether those programs, I, I'm guessing they're not directly connected, those policies, but whether they, or there is any connection at all, and, and how it looks for a residential customer and versus a commercial customer. That's yeah, uh, so there, there's actually a bright line between those two, those two types of programs. So, um, you know, if you receive a rebate for, uh, that's buying down the, part of the upfront cost of your solar system, then you cannot be on the fit. Oh, okay. Um, they, are, they are absolutely opposed. And if you, if you go on a fit, you don't get a rebate. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they are two completely different procurement Is it mechanisms. the same for the net energy metering as well? Yeah, so the, the, the rebate programs are strictly net energy metering. So, um, so we really, you, if you hear, let's, let's say, you know, a year or two from now, you have fit, you have the feed-in tariff in full effect, and you still have some net metering. Then when you as a homeowner or business owner decide to get a solar system, you have a hard choice to make, which is I do see. I go fit or do I go net metering? And, and, and that's really the choice. And then if there are rebates available for net metering, then you would get one. But, but that's the choice between the two. There's no overlap. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah. I, just, I just had two broader questions. Um, yeah. One, when you talk about consolidation in the solar industry, are you referring to the sort of installer level firms? Or do you think there's going to be consolidation at a higher level within the California solar sector? And, and, okay. and two, um, I've heard kind of some people like Sun Edison and stuff talk, say yeah. that the current pipeline of projects, when you take them all, you know, in theory should meet the 33% um, RPS target. Right. However, a lot of those projects are probably not going to be built or, yeah. or delayed, as you mentioned. And is that is that accurate to say that? And and what I mean, what's the outlook in terms of of how close California is to meeting the existing RPS? Yeah. Standards? So great questions. Um, no, I think that's the, on your latter, the second question. I think that's reasonably accurate. I mean, we don't know, right? Is the answer. And if history serves some of those barriers to getting projects implemented that I put up a slide about are going to kill a bunch of projects. And, and we've seen that, we've seen that in the, net, the larger net metering and even some smaller, you know, multi-megawatt projects um, that the capital markets have just, uh, over the last few years, have really um, put a lot of projects on hold. You know, maybe somebody had a little bit too sharp a pencil when they were proposing the thing, they got the, the jurisdiction to agree to it. And then they realized when they went to the capital markets that they really couldn't make it work. And then, uh, so the folks that really have the strength and are coming around and mopping up some of those projects are, you know, are, are taking advantage. Um, and that may be because they have uh, really attractive funding of their own. Maybe that they have a special relationship with a bank or, you know, I mean, it's funny because, you know, California has gotten all this solar, but a lot of the capital is actually coming from, you know, Goldman Sachs and you know, some of the, it's coming from Wall Street. So a lot of the, you know, Sun Edison's included, I believe. So, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, I mean, I think that's generally right. Um, and then the, what was the first uh, question? Like what, when you talk about consolidation, what does that look like? Oh, yeah, so, or developers? I mean, I'm thinking mostly the, the integrators and installers more than, um, more than, say, manufacturing. Um, you know, you don't have a hugely diverse manufacturing base now. You, you have a lot of, a number of large companies that are global in nature and, you know, don't depend on California. 
Um, but you, and even even a Sun Edison or some of the larger companies, they operate in various states, and you know they're they're they've proven themselves that they can kind of persist with changing business models. Uh, but it's going to be hard. I mean, you know, they've already been through a couple of uh, of uh, you know, the, I mean, the Sun Edison model, and and you know, they they have found found it difficult to even be able be flexible enough to change quickly enough um, to respond to the marketplace. Um, and I think that's just going to continue. Definitely, I think the folks who are most worried are the smaller installers who who are out there pounding the pavement and and doing traditional kind of regional or local businesses. I think those are the folks who are going to end up having to make decisions whether they want to sell out, whether they want to just grow aggressively, or whether they want to, you know, how they want to approach the market going forward. Because the downward price pressure is just not going to let them make a lot of money, uh, I think. Two more questions, right? You had a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. Well, I just wonder if you can give us a brief insight. How is the solar industry doing in comparison with other industries such as the wind or geothermal? I mean, in the aggregate level. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I mean, you know, I've sort of, I'm sure I've come across as a little gloom and doom here, but, um, you know, the solar industry, I mean, you saw the curve, the solar industry, for the moment, it is taking off. I mean, it's really growing. The What's happening, a lot of the sort of, relatively professionalized uh, PV installers are growing a lot. They're going to different parts of the state. They maybe started out local or regional, but they really, the scale is happening for, you know, net metered solar. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think a lot of these political fights in Sacramento are about maintaining the conditions that, under which that can happen. And so uh, I think the next couple of years will tell us a lot about um, whether, you know, how net metering persists. It'll persist in some way, but how it persists and what the alternatives that actually get fleshed out and come onto the playing field look like. So for now, things are, <clears throat> things are it's going great guns. I mean, it's one of the few sectors of the California economy that's growing, you know, uh, steadily. Um, uh, you know, and, the, and the, the question really is how long is that going to persist? So. Uh oh. So my question is based on, you know, we have these deteriorating federal and state subsidies. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have the increase in RPS. Yeah. So someone's going to have to kind of pay the piper if that happens. Is that going to be just higher electricity rates or kind of what's going to give in that case? Yeah. Well, then what you also have reducing costs. I mean, you know, the costs of solar are coming down. They have come down in the last five years tremendously, right? And DOE, Department of Energy, has a their Sunshot initiative where they're trying to get the installed cost of large-scale solar down to $1 a watt, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, it could come down into the $2 a watt range for, for even rooftop solar, I think. Um, so, uh, so partly, th so how much the piper has to be paid, I think, is, is a question. Um, the, the, so the bigger question that I think is, is, uh, is, is uh, not resolved and implies costs is not really sort of the installation of the solar itself. It's more of the modernization of the grid that enables all of these distributed resources uh, and, and um, non-dispatchable intermittent resources to be coordinated and sort of, you know, conducted, you know, I mean, the, the, the symphony analogy is kind of you know, you, symphony or, you know, I don't know if it's Rage in the Machine or if it's a symphony, right? But hopefully it's more like the latter. Um, but uh, there's got to be a lot of technology installed and upgrade, up modernization of the grid itself to be able to um, make sure that reliability and deliverability and all these things don't suffer. Um, and that'll be a locational exercise. Um, it'll be a pretty heavy-duty planning exercise that requires the development of a lot of tools. And so uh, that implies cost. And I think this new grid, um, it's unlikely, well, the way I think about it, and this is, this is, I know I'm rambling a little bit here, but the way I think about it is that what we really want from electricity is the service that it provides. So if we can have lighting for a quarter of the electricity using you know, an LED lamp versus an incandescent, then we may actually pay a similar amount for that hour of lighting, but we'll do it with a quarter of the electricity. So if you look at that from a per kilowatt hour cost charge, then yeah, it's more expensive. But, but you know, we need to sort of structure things such that the, the underlying service is, you know, we may actually pay more per unit over the long term, but there are complementary investments in energy efficiency and kind of other ways to do demand response and things like that that will enable us to have the services we need um, you know, and hopefully not have a bigger net out of pocket. So, I mean, I know it's a, 
I don't have a great answer for you, but I agree. You know, there's a lot of worry about there's a lot of worry about, from ratepayer advocates about yeah, you know, what are what are my you know what are my my you know poor families going to do when the same amount of electricity all of a sudden costs twice and they don't have the money to upgrade their house or whatever and that's an equity issue that's a real issue so I don't you know nobody has the the right answer to that I think but it's definitely a problem so thanks so much sure.